Hi, my name is Jim and I was retired. President Biden decided to name Fed Vice Chair Lael Brannard to lead his National Economic Council at the White House. That could mean the Fed is, will lose its most influential dove and increase the chances that inflation hawks will tip us into a recession, according to some recent reports. In this video, I'm going to discuss hawks, doves, and poppycock. Stay tuned. Now, I'm not an economist or a financial planner. I'm just a DIY retiree who cares about how fast we put this period of high inflation behind us. So I watch monetary policy probably closer than most retirees. Now, I have followed the Fed for decades, so I know a little about the subject. So I was taken aback by the analysis in the Wall Street Journal recently that Brainerd's departure from the Fed would risk a recession. Nick Timoros, the Fed whisperer for, at the Wall Street Journal, reported the following. At the margins, Ms. Barnard's Fed exit raises the risk of a recession because it could lead the central bank to raise rates more aggressively this spring, said Derek Tang, an economist at the forecasting for firm L.H. Mayer. If she had stayed, she would have been a coalescing force for a lot of the dubs on the committee. She was the intellectual leader of that camp in terms of pushing back and potentially against hiking in May and June, Mr. Tang said. The question is who is going to take up that mantle? I'm going to call poppycock on this and I'll explain what I know about the balance of hawks and doves on the Federal Open Market Committee. That's the monetary policy making body within the Fed. Now, Congress created the Federal Reserve and the FOMC to add both public and private voices to its structure. The president appoints the chair of the Board of Governors, the Fed chair, with the advice and consent of the Senate. Chair Powell is the most visible face of the Fed. But there are six other governors, all appointed by the president and approved by the Senate. Lael Brannard will leave next week, but that still leaves Powell and five other governors who will vote in March at the next FOMC meeting. Now, to ensure monetary policy represents the whole nation, Congress gave five votes to five of the 12 presidents of the regional Federal Reserve banks in any given year. Now, the president of the New York Fed always votes because that's where the trading desk is that's set up to control the policy rates. Now, along with the New York Fed, though, there are four other presidents whose votes rotate so that voting members always come from different parts of the country. In 2023, the presidents of Philadelphia, Minneapolis, Chicago and Dallas are voting members. Now, all 12 bank presidents participate in the discussions of the FOMC meetings, but only these five presidents and the six governors, sometimes seven if Lael had stayed, will be voting members. Now, in monetary policy, the Fed has a dual mandate for price stability and maximum employment. People call those who are more concerned about the labor market doves, and those that are more concerned about price stability hawks. Now, only three of the current members that are voting, two of the governors and one president, Chris Weller, Michelle Bowman are the two governors, and one president, Neil Kashkari in Minneapolis are considered hawks because of their past voting. The rest are all considered doves. So the idea that one less dove will tip the scales to the hawks is poppycock. 
Most policy makers in the Fed will disavow the labels hawks and doves. One former Fed policymaker preferred to be called an owl. But Fed watchers have assigned these labels. And here's a graphic I found from InTouch Capital Markets, which keeps this chart of the doves and hawks. Why does it matter? Well, we have not yet whipped inflation. Even though we're past peak inflation, we are still far above the 2% target. The latest reading of the Consumer Price Index for Urban Workers came in at 6.4% year over year, and that came in higher than expected of 6.2%. Core CPI, which excludes food and energy, also declined less than expected to 5.6%. Both of those numbers ran a little higher than they were expected. Now, the core CPI is most useful because it tracks where the Personal Consumption Expenditures, or PCE index, and that's the Fed's preferred measure, will come. But right now, we still have to wait till the end of this month for December's reading. The last reading of that was 5% in November. Now, generally, PCE runs about a point, a point and a half below CPI. The FOMC attempts to control inflation by trading and selling uh, instruments on its market desk to influence the policy rate, the federal funds rate, which is the rate that banks charge one another for overnight lending. If the dovish members of the FOMC maintain their pace of a quarter point each meeting, we will likely see two or three more rate increases. The upper limit of the federal funds rate is now at 4.75%, and it would be at 5% in March and 5.25% in May. And then if they raise one more time in June, that would bring the rate up to 5.5%. And that likely will be about a point higher than where the PCE is likely to be if you judge it based on where core CPI is. Now, the market is finally beginning to expect a higher terminal rate of about 5.5%. You can watch the progress daily on the CME FedWatch tool probabilities page. Here on Monday, before Tuesday's CPI reading came out higher than expected, they were already getting the hint that it would hit 5.5, but they were having that peak in September and then a quick retreat for the second half of the year. After that hot CPI number came in on Tuesday, the FedWatch tool upped it to three quarter point increases through June, then holding that rate until December. The next day, they thought better of it and decided maybe they'll only hold it until November. But by the end of the week here, they've now decided it's back to three hikes through June and then holding at 5.5% until the December meeting. Let's see how long that lasts. With any luck, the March meeting of the FOMC will bring greater clarity. The policymakers will update their summary of economic projections, which will include that infamous dot plot that shows where each policymaker expects the Fed funds rate to be by year end. I've discussed in past videos that history tells us we need positive real Fed funds rates, that is, Fed funds rate minus inflation, to get inflation under control. Otherwise, we will relive the 1970s and end up chasing inflation up the hill. If the next few inflation readings flatten out, what will it take to nudge that inflation rate back down towards its 2%? I think it's going to be higher rates. Now, it's interesting that this week, two of the non-voting hawks, Jim Bullard and Loretta Mester, said that they would have preferred a 50 basis point hike on February 1st, but they don't vote. 
Most of the voters are doves this year, and the doves are likely to stick with 25 basis points unless we see some unpleasant surprises. By the way, please take a moment to like and subscribe to this channel. The more likes, the higher it will be in the search results. So like and subscribe if you like entertaining ideas. I will conclude with my standard warning. I am not a financial planner. I have no initials after my name. So take these as entertaining ideas from one educated consumer to another. Always do your own due diligence and seek out a professional if you need one. See you next time.